This is UI Therapy, Episode 4. Cue the music. Welcome to the UI Therapy Podcast. My name is Jake Hopking, and I'm a user interface design and development expert, online user experience consultant, digital product designer, and I'm also a keen photographer and complete coffee addict. Each week, you're going to learn actionable strategies, mindsets, tips, and tricks that will help you take the guesswork and confusion out of designing and building beautiful and intuitive user interfaces. This podcast is your secret weapon in cutting through the paralysis of tooling, framework, and methodology analysis. And now, onto this week's episode. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the UI Therapy Podcast. In this week's show, I will be talking about creativity and where maybe where it comes from and different types of creativity and innovation in design and in creativity as well. The theme here is creativity and it doesn't have a great deal of structure. I've just been having a bit of a, a, bit of a delve into the thought process and what I think creativity is and where it comes from. It's been a bit of an interesting, been an interesting journey for me just to think about and write down some thoughts. But before I get into that, I thought I would say hello to any new subscribers to the show. Well, all new subscribers to the show, because the last episode, or the last three episodes I recorded, I hadn't launched, and it would be impossible to have any subscribers at that time. If you are listening to me in this episode, awesome. Thank you so much for joining, and I'm really honoured to have your time, really. However, I would like to hear from you, and... I genuinely mean that. I want to know what you want to know about. I want to hear what, you, what you're struggling with or what you'd like me to cover or what topics you'd like me to go more in depth into. Um, ideas for the show, that would be really great. Yeah, so welcome. And if you're listening to the show and you want some stickers, I have put in a, a rather large order <laughs> for stickers. I've ordered... 600 stickers, not all the same. There are four different designs. Three designs are round, seven centimeter vinyl. One is of the show logo. Then there's a light version, which is more blue and more pastely. And then there is a English themed, or maybe you could say London themed one, which is using illustrator art that my wife has produced for some other clients and I've incorporated that into my logo <laughs> kind of mashing up my my stag with a beef eater and there's also a few London landmarks like Big Ben or Palace of Westminster and London Eye and there's also another sticker which is a large heart with a stag inside it and a banner saying uitherapy.fm. Now, honestly, you can have these stickers completely free. All you have to do, so you get one of each, so you get four for nothing, for free. All I ask is that you subscribe to the show, if you haven't already, of course, and you write a review in iTunes. Now, that requires you to have an Apple ID. So if you don't have an Apple ID, don't worry about it. If you could just write a, a review on Twitter, and then share that with your following, and include a link to the show, that would, that would qualify. Um, however, if you do listen on Apple Podcasts or through iTunes, then leaving a review would be really, really awesome, and that would be probably the best outcome, because I'd like to try and I would like to play two Apple Podcasts algorithms for new and noteworthy podcasts. And then also if you follow the show on Twitter, so that's at UI Therapy. And if you want to, you can follow me on Instagram as well. But the main focus here is subscribe wherever you listen, write a review or share a review on Twitter, and subscribe on Twitter. And there's a Google form on uitherapy.fm in the journal. You'll find a post called Stickers or Free Stickers. And in there, there'll be obviously detailed instructions about how to do that with also some images of the mock-ups at the moment. But depending on how quickly I receive the order, maybe some actual photographs 
of 600 stickers. <laughs> I'm, quite, I'm quite excited to see 600 stickers. Um, I'll, I'll also share where I bought them and that kind of thing. If you go to the journal, you'll see a stickers post. Click on that and in there will be detailed instructions along with the form that you can fill in with your details and also a screenshot of the review you've put into Apple iTunes or you've shared on social media somewhere. And once you've sent that, I will send you some stickers anywhere you live in the world, honestly. I'd really like to spread word of the show. I'd really like to get this out there. I'd like to promote it. And I think giving away things for free, well, asking for a little bit of your time and rewarding you with something is a, I think it's a fair, a fair trade. Now, I would also like to introduce a, a different kind of format to the show. And I'm going to call these quick cuppers because I'm English and I love tea. So that's what we say here in the UK. So it's like a, a quick chat about what you've been up to or a, a little topic about something along with a cup of tea. So a quick cuppa, way, way, way too much information about quick cuppa, but I've got to be inclusive about audiences. I don't know where, where, the, where in the world you might be listening and a quick cuppa might mean something completely different or not have any meaning at all wherever you live. So there's that. And in the first one today, I will be talking about creativity and just sharing ideas about it, really. There's, it hasn't got a particularly strong structure, but I've been thinking about it and jotting some ideas down. So I thought I'd, uh, yeah, begin a conversation, really. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is just more, more like a, air quotes, working document, <laughs> working hypothesis. It's just me thinking about stuff and sharing it. And I'd really love to hear your thoughts on it, actually. That would be, that would be the best outcome of this episode and this thought process. If you could let me know your thoughts on what I'm talking about. And if you think I'm talking a load of shit or if I seem to be heading in some direction that makes some modicum of sense, that would be awesome. So that's enough housekeeping. Let's move on to this week's show, which is entitled Thoughts on Creativity, Innovation and Intuition in Design. Now, I'm going to probably have a few <laughs> digressions and some of these things are a little bit tangential. Hopefully it will flow together. To start off with, I think we need to talk about innovation in design. And it's important to understand that I'm not just talking about UI design here. I'm talking about all design. So it could be, it could be industrial design. It could be product design. It could be innovation design. It could be just the kind of the, the process of thinking in a creative way. But um, broadly, I think there are, I think there are three types of innovation. Firstly, design can begin with the recognition of societal changes or trends. And keep in mind trends is one of the key ingredients, I think, in creativity, which I'll get on to a bit later. And this involves, well, not trends, but the recognition of societal changes involves listening carefully to users' voices and needs. And I think this kind of design could be called demand-driven design. Secondly, design can begin with discovery or development in science, technology, or the arts. And this can be called genesis design. And examples of this can be a new platform or a new media type, or I mean, new platform, new media can lead into app design, which was a completely new type of media at the time it was introduced. Thirdly, design can begin with the generation of a product idea aimed at bridging the gap between demand and genesis. These three approaches are not mutually exclusive and they can and usually are applied in parallel. Both demand and genesis are essential for design and in actual cases of breakthrough design, these three approaches are often very tightly integrated. With kind of innovation 
roughly established. I think it's now good to look at innovation and design as one, like innovation design. And in this domain, I think there are two types of creativity. The first type of creativity is the out of the box or outside of the box creativity that generates ideas which depart from what is believed to be common sense or conventional preconceived notions or wisdom. An essential part of this type of creativity lies in successfully eliminating preconceived notions and breaking down the wall of fixation. Um, yeah, fixation is an interesting term. Um, it wasn't one I'd actually really thought about before and, and through looking at research I came, I came across what it was and why it's so kind of important within this first type. So the term fixation refers to the designer's reluctance or inability in some cases to consider multiple strategies or formulate and solve a design need. The design fixation phenomenon severely limits and results in pedestrian design solutions. It is fundamentally essential for designers to move past fixation, to realise realize potential and create, well, create remarkable solutions. Um, now, from looking at this stuff, I came across a, a famous, oh, maybe it wasn't famous, but I didn't, maybe it is famous, but I didn't know it. It's called the nine point problem, which kind of hard to describe a visual challenge or a visual puzzle <laughs> in an audio. But um, actually, it probably isn't. It's not that difficult. It's basically, it's a three by three grid of points, just single dots. And the challenge is to, without taking off the pencil from the paper, connect all the dots in four straight lines. So you start at one dot and then you can either move horizontally or vertically or diagonally, but only in four lines. Maybe you want to pause this podcast a little bit and think about how that works or think about a solution. Yeah, I spent a while on it when I saw, saw, the, saw the question and I'll be honest, I didn't. I didn't solve it. <laughs> I had to see the answer, then it's obviously, then it's just so obvious. But that, that's, it, it really illustrates the point of fixation. It's like when you're completely lost in this, well, you just, you just can't see outside, you can't see out, around, around the solution, which is why uh, I've, I've talked about this, is out of the box or outside of the box thinking or design or creativity. Until you actually think, actually, until you actually see outside of it, you're kind of locked. But anyway, the point here is, the solution involves literally going outside of the bounds, the, outside the box of, outside the grid, outside the box grid. And then you can, if you go out and then, then move that back in, so you're creating like a, a triangular shape that, that extends beyond the grid and then back, your lines are straight and you don't take the pencil off the paper, but you are connecting all dots with four lines. And that kind of illustrates the perfect illustration of fixation, because once you, once you see how simple it is, you just move on. And it's like, how did I not see that to begin with? Anyway, a bit of a digression there, but I think it's important to know what fixation is and why it's so important to overcome or to create brilliant design solutions. Now there's the other type of innovation design. Um, this other type of creativity is demonstrated in a, a concept of, well, I kind of like the, the third point of the innovation one prior to this. It's the concept of connecting seemingly unrelated ideas, knowledge, or technologies. A typical cited example is the original Macintosh computer, which is a product of combining graphical user interfaces, which were at the time under development at Xerox, or within a small form factor. And there's also, it's easy to focus on products from Apple during the reign of jobs. You can look at the iPhone as well as another example. I mean, there were plenty of PDAs at the time, 
but there wasn't this kind of cohesive user-friendly package which the iPhone was the first to do really um, and you know <laughs> I'll keep on the the jobs theme by quoting him when he famously said creativity is just connecting things now with that second set of definitions established I'd like to move on to I think what are probably new definitions around design they're not ones I've I've come across these new terms, which I'm going to talk about now. But before I do, I think it's important to understand a couple of words which are, are used within these terms. So, firstly, so I, I would like to introduce the concept of quantitative and qualitative design. So, quantitative design and qualitative design. Before I go on and give you a broader definition of what they are, I think it's really important that everyone's on the same page about what is qualitative and what is quantitative. Um, I've put together a little table, which you can see in the show notes for this episode, which is at uitherapy.fm slash episode slash four, the number four. So yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I will read through it briefly. Um, but I think it, I'd recommend that you go to the post and look at the table itself because communicating tables in audio again is probably a little bit difficult. Anyway, let's give us a shot. So first row is data type. And for qualitative, I've got consists of descriptions and statements that are measured and expressed subjectively. For quantitative, I've got consists of objective information that can be measured and expressed numerically. An example for qualitative is this car makes me feel important and the burgundy interior is soft and luxurious. An example for quantitative, this car has 12 windows, 8 wheels, and the interior uses 100 meters of leather. Questions answered. Qualitative, why? Quantitative, how many, how much? Goals. Qualitative, both formative and summative. Inform design decisions. Identify usability issues and find solutions for them. Quantitative, mostly summative. Evaluate the usability of an existing design trend. Track usability over time. Compare design with competitors or previous iterations through consistent metrics. When is it used? Qualitative, any time, during redesign or when you have a final work in product. Quantitative, when you have a working product, either at the beginning or end of a design cycle. Outcome, qualitative, findings based on the designer's impressions, intuition and experience. Quantitative, statistically meaningful results that are likely to be replicated in a different study. Methodology, qualitative. Few participants. Flexible study conditions that can be adjusted according to the team's needs. And a think aloud protocol. Quantitative. Many participants. Well defined. Strictly controlled study conditions. Usually no think aloud. Now that we're on the same page and everyone should understand what the definitions of quantitative and qualitative are. I'd like to move on to the terms. Firstly, quantitative design. Mass-produced and community-led design, which are iterative in nature and follow the trends and are seen as design standards. These aren't radical, and as such they are easy to replicate. They are safe, efficient, tested, 
and validated forms of design. They are the outcomes and formalization of qualitative design. And they bring society or users quantitative change. Examples in UI would be things like flat design or the overuse of Twitter's bootstrap or Google's material UI. Now, I don't mean to undermine the importance of quantitative design. On the contrary, I believe because of its battle-tested existence, you know, it affords the user or it affords the, the designer of these tools freedom to experiment within its boundaries and free of the fixation often associated with qualitative design, i.e. you can get things done quickly and be safe in the knowledge that the end result will at least be cohesive in its aesthetic. These are powerful tools for prototyping products, for ideas, for user flows, for, for admin portals, for developers to use. And I, I talked about in the first episode I recorded about um, my, my belief that designers and developers should be more closely aligned. And tools like this, I, I do believe they make a difference for developers to understand design at a, better, at a deeper level. Secondly, qualitative design. So qualitative design gives birth to products and new design language that can realise new lifestyles or lead to the creation of new cultures. I know, big stuff. For example, the smartphone and app design has led to entirely new ways of consuming content or interacting with friends and family or producing work or conducting business or communicating with colleagues. These changes have in turn had cultural impact, influencing the way we exist in society. For example, one... Yeah, one can still consider being connected with friends or family or colleagues despite not physically being in the same location. A further example, also from smartphones, is pinch. <laughs> is pinching to zoom in and pinching to zoom out on the screen. Now, this is not a manipulation that humans perform in the natural world, but we can perform them quite naturally. We have only recently come to adopt these manipulations as a result of technological development and UI design. I think this new manipulation, this new interaction, has broadened the scope of what feels natural for us as society. So it's given society a new meaning, and I think that's huge. It's a massive, a massive outcome from the humble smartphone, the thing that is now so, so prosaic to us, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, anyway, I think that's pretty big. Um, then as a third example for qualitative design and focusing on aesthetics, uh, I think we could look at kind of cutting edge or bleeding edge or experimental interface design. There's something called neomorphism or neomorphism. And it was initially disregarded as a fad, but Apple, with their Big Sur OS update, has begun to incorporate elements of it in its icon design. Now, I guess I should give you a definition of what new morphism is. It's a pretty new trend and a term that's received a healthy amount of buzz. Its aesthetic is marked by minimal and real-looking UI that's akin to a new take on skeuomorphism. That's a design trend that's thankfully pretty much dead, I think. But it's, it's, skeuomorphism is about replicating the real world inside a user interface. So examples of it, or classic examples of it, are things like a calendar app, which will take the graphics from a real world kind of ring binder calendar and implement them into the UI. Or a 
a note taking app, which will replicate a, a lined note paper, lined notebook. And for instance, if you were to complete a task, it would have a, a wiggly biro pen line through the completed task. Another example would be something like a notice board. It would have a cork background and a wooden frame with actual pins and post-it notes, all in digital UI. So I think that makes sense. Now, back to new morphism. It doesn't seek to replicate the real world as skew morphism did. It seeks to give interfaces a, a lifelike experience through the use of light, shadows and gradients, all of which are used to emulate depth. It's, it's too early days to know what, what the real outcomes of new morphism is going to be, what the qualitative impact will be, and how that will trickle down into quantitative design. But it's interesting to think about what, what new technology or what societal influences this kind of design might have. Um, will this new form of UI design influence the implementation of current and new technologies to create a tactile experience for the smartphone user? One can imagine a future where the screen becomes, you know, fully tactile and affords blind interaction, much like that of a traditional remote control, for instance, or a much, perhaps a much greater societal benefit could be to allow literally the blind or those with visual disabilities to learn to use apps based upon tactile feedback. Um, I don't know, when in, when in disability mode, there could be a, a fixed layout that can be learned with a high degree of accuracy. Now, that is super exciting. It's an awesome possibility. And yeah, obviously one that I hope comes to fruition. I mean, and this, yeah, this could be realized thanks to the three dimensional aesthetic, which defines new morphism itself. Which leads me on to why is qualitative design important? Why I think qualitative design is important. I think my previous example. Well, previous few examples actually I think paint, a, paint a pretty compelling argument for why it's important, but I'll further that a bit more. I I believe that exploring and experimenting with UI design paradigms can awaken emotions and sensibilities within us that without this form of qualitative experimentation would lie unexplored and, 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 un, and unawakened, really, i.e. qualitative shifts in design can affect user experience and engagement in ways currently unexplored and ultimately lead to new forms of interaction that will eventually become natural or second nature to society. And my, my kind of thought process around societal benefits of those with disabilities is a, a good example of this. That covers my definitions of qualitative design and quantitative design. Now, this is very much working, working document stuff. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So please let me know. Let's have a, let's have a chat about it. Let's have a conversation about it. Um, now I realise that this is supposed to be a quick cuppa, so I, I, I'm going to kind of wrap it up. But um, before I do that, I will I will go through intuition and touch on my three bits that I three pieces of information which I think are important to design, which I alluded to at the beginning of this, and I think it would be bad of me to end an episode without closing the, closing the loop. Um, so before that, let's do intuition or gut feeling. Intuition or gut feeling is said to play 
an important role in decision making. And again, Steve Jobs spoke of the importance of believing in one's intuition, saying, and quote, and most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition, end quote. So what then is intuition or gut feeling? A dictionary definition from the Oxford Dictionary describes intuition as the ability to understand something instinctively without the need for conscious reasoning and gut feeling as a feeling or reaction based on a instinctive emotional response rather than considered thought. Now, I've been looking a lot around this and it seems like many studies have been conducted on the phenomena of intuition. And these studies discuss intuition in a connection with things like analytical process or unconscious thought, decision making, tacit knowledge, problem solving, expertise and experience. One can think of intuition or one can think of average intuition as pragmatically touching on existing elements and you organically combine them in a, a flash of insight or a new discovery or a flash of inspiration for a new design or a, a new I don't know, a new logo or something, you know, something or a new kind of interaction pattern just it's like pops into your mind. It's like, wow, amazing. Um, and they're kind of, they're surprising, I think. Like a, an average intuition is surprising. It's like, I've done it. That's amazing. Where did that come from? And you can, you can compare that to an expert intuition, which is, I think, effective in solving the same kind of problems, but much faster. Um, faster and faster and faster by recognizing, recognizing by recognizing their patterns as you get better at your job. So, I think as your intuition increases, it becomes less shocking, less surprising. But you still have those moments. We all have them. I mean, they're wonderful moments in a designer's designer's life, designer's time. There's there's there's, there's, there's magical moments of, of inspiration which you know are right and that's where the intuition is that's where it comes from that's when you know that you know it's right because your intuition says so and that's built up on a body of knowledge or body of experience that spans your entire career and i think the earlier you are on in in your career the more those little flashes you have uh, they're smaller i think but no that doesn't mean they're <laughs> less important or less wonderful enjoy them they're brilliant but as you get more experience and you've been doing this for longer, those, those moments come a lot less frequently. But I think that when they do come, they feel, they feel, they feel massive, they feel, but they feel brilliant. Um, anyway, <laughs> a bit of a, a digression there. Um, yeah, so I think we can kind of define intuition as, as that which enables instantaneous decision-making following patterns recognized based on one's experience. Intuition is obviously not the end in the creative process. It's a, a constantly changing body of knowledge and expertise. It is updated and its models refined by one's constant increase in expertise and knowledge through one's ongoing process of practicing one's art. This feedback cycle is essential in becoming an expert or senior level designer now as i mentioned at the beginning trends i think we've probably forgotten about that because it's now been 45 minutes um but this isn't to say that simply practicing one skill will lead to better intuition i i don't think so anyway we have to factor in external influences um and by this i mean exposure to trends and the collective visual landscape that we work in. Now, obviously, this is where I think it gets a little bit murky, I think, and a little bit magical, maybe. But I think, yeah, so I think to cut this to, to cut a long story short, I wanted to get to this last, this last little bit, 
this last probably the last, last sentence. I think intuition, expertise, and trends are fundamentally linked, and are well, they are the elements of creativity and good design. They are the ingredients of creativity and good design. They are the essential ingredients. So intuition, expertise, and trends. I'd like to talk a lot more about this, but I'm. I'm going to cut this episode here and I would like to hear your thoughts and I'd like to have a discussion with this. I'd like to talk to somebody that either agrees with me on this or doesn't agree with me. Uh, either or. Or we could have a, I don't know, a conversation. We could have a few people on. That would be interesting. But I'd like to, I'd like to get further into this rabbit hole of creativity and intuition and innovation and creativity experience and expertise and trends and all that because it really is a pretty fascinating thing creativity it's absolutely wonderful and sometimes completely elusive but um but other times it's just all consuming and it's an incredible thing to have as a designer or as a creator or as an artist it's wonderful um now i know that actually you have the same kind of feelings as a developer um i've 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 had the same kind of same kind of feelings when i'm writing some i don't know some beautiful function for instance or you're lost in creating some kind of complicated component which is all kind of flowing together and i i I can totally get that um but this, when, when you have these moments of all-consuming creativity, there's few experiences like that. And yeah, I'm just trying to dig a little bit deeper into where that comes from and maybe not tap into it on demand, but try and learn how to harness it better or maybe, maybe you can't. Maybe you can't control these things. But anyway, I digress. Um, thanks again for your time getting to the end of, the end of this episode. Um, Hope you had some value in it. And as I keep saying, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and your thoughts on the show in general, actually. That would be amazing. Um, as I said already, check out uitherapy.fm, head to the journal and click on the stickers post and claim yourself some free stickers. Hopefully, actually, no, I think hopefully the, the actual printed material, the actual printed stickers, the 600 of them <laughs> will be here this week and I can put some actual photographs up so you can see something real something tangible not just mock-ups anyway thank you again until the next time bye show notes for this episode can be found at uitherapy.fm if you enjoyed listening one really easy way to support this show is to leave a quick rating or review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts as it really helps other people find the show if you have any feedback or questions for this or any other episodes you can reach me on Twitter at UI Therapy, or I'm at Jake Hopking. Or you can send an email to show at uitherapy.fm. Thanks so much for listening to UI Therapy, and I'll catch you next time. Cheerio. <laughs>